Hello, uh, welcome. This is the uh, taster uh, teaser uh, video for uh, the peer respite Soteria Summit session that's taking place on October the 17th. Well, we've got a really, really good range of panelists where we're going to be talking about organisation, the admin uh, things to do with funding and setting up boards. So uh, this is our chance to find out a little bit um, that will encourage you to come back on the 17th of October. So we have uh, Jim Gottstein here, Cindy Fisher and Susan Mazzante. So um, I'm going to ask them just about one of those things. I'm going to ask them about funding because I know for some people that's really, really crucial for, for getting going. So, um, would you like to start first of all, Jim, and tell us a little bit about how you set about funding the Soteria House in, uh, in Alaska? Well, Alaska is uh, quite unique in that we have this Alaska Mental Health Trust Authority that was established through litigation when the state of Alaska stole a million acres of land that was granted in trust for the uh, mental health program of Alaska. I, I was actually involved in that litigation. And so the trust authority, uh, especially at that time was interested in funding innovative things. And they had a really, I think, good way of looking at evaluating their programs, which was, um, is what we're doing helping our beneficiaries because they thought that they're a trust. Um, is it improving their lives? As opposed to, uh, I think the normal bureaucratic or agency way of looking at things, which is how much money are we spending? Uh, and so the more money you're spending or, you know, they, is considered the, uh, uh, you know, an indication of doing better when actually, you know, you could say that that's, um, that means nobody's getting better because you keep spending money on them. And uh, so anyway, so they were interested in uh, funding innovative things and, and Susan was cr critical in, in the whole thing and, and we showed them, the, you know, the evidence that we had and how, how it would be good. And so they, they gave the seed money for it. Uh, and then we, uh, and, and their idea too was to get a put in the in the state of Alaska's budget, which we did um, for a while. And then uh, uh, anyway, that's how we got it got it going. You know, that, keeping it going was another another thank issue. You. Yes. So I was wondering, Susan, would you be able to say a little bit about how you kept the funding going? Because both of those things are really important. So when I think about funding, I, I always think um, even though you think it's a sure thing forever, it really isn't. So always look at like what's available, but what's really important is to not just chase the funds, but to uh, never stray from your mission or your purpose unless your organization decides to do that and then and then don't call it soteria or peer respite, call it what it is, right? So, cause the funding totally shapes what happens. Um, and I know Jim kind of trailed off around the state legislative funding, but that, uh, that got into the budget, the mental health budget and Alaska is unique from other US states because they also have a general budget and they have a specific mental health budget, which I believe probably had to do with the trust litigation that Jim was involved in. So they actually had their own budget. I'd never worked anywhere where they had that. And they actually put a soteria in, uh, in they didn't cover the whole thing, but a substantial amount for like ever. It was a line item thing in the budget. It wasn't just regular mental health money. Um, so that being said, when I think about other places, I always think about how can I help other places start it? Well, every state is unique. Every country is unique. So mm -hmm. really understand your different funding streams and um, never, as if you want to continue your vision, never stray from that and really pay attention to that and don't go sort of like into the 
what, what's the hottest, latest new thing um, because the funding's going there. That's, that's what I think about funding, but we had, a, a, we had a many funding streams, including the state, which paid for probably little more than half um, the trust money for a while, but they were pretty, that Jim talked about, but they like to do startup and then pull out. Um, mm -hmm. And then, uh, and then we, uh, and then I thought we needed to do more fundraising so that, cause that money is always independent. And uh, so I recommend anybody who's doing any of these things to really focus on some independent fundraising. And, um, and we also had, uh, and we had a, a small portion of Medicaid money, which does impact on how the program runs. So, cause Medicaid's a disease system and I, we got a lot of criticism for that. I'm just saying it's, it's it, I'm not sure how much that impacted or didn't impact, but um, pay attention to all that stuff and, uh, and stick to your mission and your vision. So when I hear about sustainability, I see that organizations that lose their funding were not sustainable to their mission, mm -hmm. their purpose, and their vision. Mm -hmm. that, that's my opinion. So yes. I, I'm done. <laughs> no, thank you. No, I think that's really, really important to consider that. Now, as you say, you, you can end up having to jump through hoops to keep the funding, and you can become dangerously close to what you're trying to avoid. So really, really important to remember that. Not easy, but important. So that's one example of how a Soteria House was, was funded. I was just wondering, Cindy, if you'd like to tell us a little bit about the, the alternative that, that you're trying to set up. So I know that uh, you've, you, you hopefully have secured some funding. Would you like to tell us a little bit about that and where it is? Sure. Um, so first of all, I want to kind of reiterate, and I do believe very much what Susan said about um, be careful of where the funding comes from. And with that said, I will say that um, as a, I had a, a, a very loose-knit network of mothers of uh, adult children um, that had been harmed in the mental health system. We were called the Moms, the Movement of Moms Standing Up Together. And for years, we went in search of housing. Um, we were even thinking of more landed community, um, like uh, intentional community, which is not necessarily the Soteria model, but all of us were struggling financially because our lives were so devoted to trying to help our children with the trauma they experienced and then help them with the trauma of the treatment. Um, so recently my daughter um, seeing that I wouldn't be able to take care of my son for the rest of my life, um, was able to hook up with a nonprofit organization and they got $300,000 to go towards either the purchase of a property or a home, but there is strings attached, the money, which there's a lot out there right now. And this is what Susan cautioned against was like following the money. Um, but I'm hoping that my own awareness of the strings that are attached to that um, will be able to negotiate so that even though it's called an adult family home, AFH for the seriously mentally ill, and I do not like that title, but that is the framework that it's in. Um, there is a lot of leeway in there. I can hire the staff. I can train the staff. I can create the program inside there. So it's not going to be a soteria house. It's not going to be a peer respite house, but it certainly is a bridge to bring, like I'm trained in open dialogue. And in another year, I will be able to train a year and a half, train people in open dialogue. So it's, it's an opening to bring in alternative ways of being with people I certainly will not call it a soteria or peer respite because it is not, but I do feel that it is um, a step that I am hoping will, I'll be able to be that compass to keep it in the direction of the North Star 
uh, um, being with and eventually peer led um, alternatives. Uh, that yeah. sounds very encouraging, Cindy. And I think uh, that's what's so important about this this summit and this way of working is that we're making connections where we can support each other. So hopefully from that will come. And uh, welcome Todd. Uh, we, we were just talking today about funding. And I know that's something that people are really um, keen to learn more about. So would you be able to tell us about the, um, the peer recovery service in Iowa? Have I got that right, Todd? Yep, that is right. Uh, Thank you. About where your funding, how you went about setting up your funding and where how you can make it sustainable. Absolutely. Thank you very much. And so it's like what came first, the chicken or the egg? And you got to do that when you're working on a peer respite project. You know, do I get the funding first and then decide the house or do I get the house first and then decide to get the funding? Mm -hmm. So I kind of worked on both, to be honest. And what I did myself is I personally uh, had a problem with zoning because we know that can be an issue as well, right? Not in my backyard. Um, so I went to our local hospital in our rural town and I said, hey, you own three houses. Would you let us use one of them houses for a couple of years as a pilot project to get this started? And they said, yes. And actually uh, among some of that conversation, we went to their philanthropy board and got the startup money to be able to start the peer respite in Iowa, in a rural area. And then also went to our region that is five counties. And that's where our actual, and I don't call it sustainable funding because here's the problem that we have in our nation. Not one person wants to fund the whole thing, nor should they, right? And people ask me all the time, who should fund peer respite? Well, that would be your neighbor, your employer, your employee, your pastor, your dry cleaners, all this. Because again, you walk around and one in five are dealing with that mental health. And what are we called to do as human beings? Called to support our neighbors. And these are our neighbors. They're our family members, our friends, our, our groups. Um, it's everybody. And, and I'm so glad to be here talking about funding now because now I'm in a situation where I have until June 1st to move our respite house because they are now going to tear it down. And so I'm in the middle of trying to start a capital campaign. And again, we have that not in my backyard, but here's the advantage that I have with my loaded artillery. And that is that I have three years that I've served, two, served 253 people that would have went into jail. I've served, served 253 people that would have cost over $2,000 a day. And average now is $430 a day at our respite house. So I'm really working on that. And our region now has seen the difference we've made and actually just got back from a conversation where it looks like some of the spend down money that they have as a region that they're gonna be able to give us anywhere between 300 and 400,000 to actually purchase the house with, again, like Cindy said, some strings attached because it's taxpayer dollars, which is all great and fine. Um, I'll do the little strings um, because here's the thing, we know this works. And, and I often tell people, you know, they're always telling me uh, in the hospital, in the jail, well, we see Jim every 30 days. He's in here every month. And I don't know if you've ever put a Band-Aid on a wound that probably needs a stitch, but if you put a Band-Aid on, what happens? It comes off and you need to have another Band-Aid. So if we start healing within in that wound, in that first step, we might not even need to get to the sixth step. And I also refer to it as a two bedroom house you build. Do you build 12 steps or do you build the, the six through 12 step? You have, to build, you have to build step one and that's what we are as a peer respite. It's that diversionary. It, it's not a fact really to me that we're saving, you know, 1600 or plus dollars. To me, it's the fact that I'm making a difference in these people's lives where they might not need to ever go back to that sixth step. Todd, thank you so much 
And all of these stories to me are so inspirational. And I know that uh, this will encourage people to come and join us on the 17th of October um, and uh, find out more from others too, who've, who've helped to set things up and find out, out, out more about uh, uh, other organizational issues that I know people think are really important and we're all, we can all learn together along the way. So thank you, the four of you for your contribution and we look forward to hearing you again a week on Sunday. Thank you.